It's time for our Bible readings now. Our first reading comes from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament, uh, chapter 23, beginning at verse 1. Isaiah 23, starting at verse 1. A prophecy against Tyre. Wail, you ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed and left without house or harbour. From the land of Cyprus word has come to them. Be silent, you people of the island, and you merchants of Sidon, whom the seafarers have enriched. On the great waters came the grain from Shihor. The harvest of the Nile was the revenue of Tyre, and she became the marketplace of the nations. Be ashamed, Sidon, and you fortress of the sea, for the sea has spoken. I have neither been in labour nor given birth. I have neither reared sons nor brought up daughters. When the word comes to Egypt, they will be in anguish at the report from Tyre. Cross over to Tarshish, wail, you people of the island. Is this your city of revelry, the old, old city, whose feet have taken her to settle in far-off lands? Who planned this against Tyre, the bestower of crowns, whose merchants are princes, whose traders are renowned in the earth? The Lord Almighty planned it, to bring down her pride in all her splendour and to humble all who are renowned on the earth. Till your land as they do along the Nile, daughter Tarshish, for you no longer have a harbour. The Lord has stretched out his hand over the sea and made its kingdoms tremble. He has given an order concerning Phoenicia that her fortresses be destroyed. He said, No more your revelling, virgin daughter Sidon, now crushed. Up! Cross over to Cyprus. Even there you will find no rest. Look at the land of the Babylonians, this people that is now of no account. The Assyrians have made it a place for desert creatures. They raised up their siege towers. They stripped its fortresses bare and turned it into a ruin. Wail, you ships of Tarshish. Your fortress is destroyed. At that time, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. But at the end of these 70 years, it will happen to Tyre, as in the song of the prostitute. Take up a harp, walk through the city, you forgotten prostitute. Play the harp well, sing many a song, so that you will be remembered. At the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her lucrative prostitution and will ply her trade with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. Yet her profit and her earnings will be set apart for the Lord. They will not be stored up or hoarded. Her profits will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. Our second reading is from the New Testament from the book of the first book uh, of Timothy, beginning at, at uh, chapter six, beginning at verse six. So one Timothy six, beginning at verse six. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith 
and pierced themselves with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God, who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who, while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be honour and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for those who have been really worried about me with my wife and child being overseas. And I've had so many offers of meals and dinners and company. It's, um, I feel so loved, but I also, it, it is a big house that I live in and I can now hear the clock ticking. Um, I don't normally hear that, but I also realize it's what, it's the life that many of you also have normally. So um, I remember that. Uh, we're, we're looking at Isaiah 23 this morning. It would help to see a Bible before you open. So if you don't have one and you'd like one, just stick up your hand. And I might ask um, Noel, he'll pass one out to you. Isaiah 23 is where we are. Let me pray for us. Father, we pray you would open our eyes so that we can see your sovereign care over us. And we pray now that you'd speak to us through the preaching of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's never been a group of people as wealthy as we are. We are so well off. We're, we live in one of the most wealthiest nations in the world. And if you're, if you're employed in Australia, you are within the top 5% of the richest people in the world. Now, we also live in a very wealthy city, don't we? Um, there's, you look around at our city and you can see construction taking place, which is a sign of a wealthy city. There's tall buildings going up, there's bridges, there's boats, there's public transport, there's parks, there's sporting games. Go the Eels, right? It's, it's, it's a wonderful city that we live in. There's markets and shops and we call it the Emerald City, for a good reason. Not, it's not just because we live in the land of Oz, it's because it speaks to our opulence. There's high real estate prices, there's beautiful beaches, there's fine food and fine wine. You can have it all in Sydney. We are so rich. What would God have to say to a wealthy city like ours? What would God say to a rich city like Sydney? Now, we began last week a series in Isaiah, chapter 13 to 39 is where we're landing, and we're looking at God and the nations. And in the first 10 chapters, um, it's as though Isaiah looks into his prophetic 
prophetic crystal ball, it's a hard word to say, prophetic crystal ball, and he sees God, God's future over the nations, God's ruling over the nations. And we looked last week at chapter 13 with an oracle against Babylon. And today we're going to look at the end of these oracles against the nations, a, the city of Tyre in chapter 23. And it's like Babylon and Tyre, think of them as bookends to the series of prophecies against the nations because Babylon represents the pride of the nations. And when we come to Tyre, Tyre represents the wealth and the affluence of the nations. Babylon is the great nation on the land and Tyre from the nation of Phoenicia is the great nation on the sea. Right? Babylon is a nation that uses force to get her way. Whereas what does Tyre use? Seduction. Wealth, materialism, seduction, even prostitution. It's all here in Isaiah chapter 23. Let's have a look. We're going to look at this in three steps. We'll see, the, first of all, the message we need to hear. And then secondly, the principle in life that you can bank on. And then thirdly, the investment for us. The message, the principle, the investment. The, the message we need to hear. So we have a map here of uh, Tyre. Um, Tyre is, is located in um, modern-day Beirut. There's a, just to show you where Tyre is. And um, it's a prime trading city of the Middle East. It was a port city, the entryway into Phoenicia. It was an impressive city, an alluring city. Uh, as you can see on the map, it's a harbour city, and so ships would come and go from all directions with their trade full of goodies, um, trading with, with Tyre. It was the entry point. And the sister city to Tyre was, was Sidon. Uh, Sidon. And, and the places on this map that we'll, I just want to point out are places that are pointed out in this passage. They're all places that Tyre does business with. And so there's trading with Cyprus. Um, there's the buying of grain with Egypt, and there's also the trading with the faraway ships of Tarshish. Tarshish is off in Spain, um, and the, the ships of Tarshish would be loaded with, with goods doing business with, with Tyre. And if you look at this chapter, um, the, the first section ends... See, look at verse 1 and verse 14. It, it ends with these words, Wail, O ships of Tarshish. Okay, I want you to notice the wealth of Tyre from this passage. Do you see verse 2? It says um, that she became a marketplace for the nations. Uh, uh, this, th this is a city that has bustle and, and excitement. There's trade that's going on. Um, this is like the New York City of the nations. In verse 7, we read that she is the old, old city whose feet have taken her to settle in far away lands. Okay, businessmen would travel far and wide from Tyre. Um, and it was an ancient city. Even ancient history records this city as being ancient, right? That's how old it is. It's been there forever. Um, in verse 8, she is the bestower of crowns. She has colonies. She has appointed rulers um, whose merchants, verse 8, are princes whose traders are renowned in the earth. See, her, her merchants had worldwide reputation. Think of Tyre as like the Google of the ancient world, all right? The, 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 the reputation was just far-reaching, um, far-reaching influence. Can you smell the money? Okay, this is Tyre. But what happened? What happened to this great city? Well, verse 1 says, Wail, you ships of Tarshish, for Tyre is destroyed and left without house or harbour. Um, from the land of Cyprus, word has come to them. See, this wealthy city came crashing down. 
And as you keep reading this chapter, um, it, it's, it's a picture of news travelling fast. Okay? It's an image of the global reaction of Tyre's downfall. Okay? Verse 1, again, first the island of Cyprus. Here's the news. Right? And, and the word comes to them. And then the city of, of Sidon. Here's the news. And they're stunned into silence. Verse 4, we read, Be ashamed, Sidon. And your, you fortress of the sea, for the sea has spoken. I have neither been in labour nor given birth. I have neither reared sons nor brought up daughters. It's as though Tyre has never existed, wiped out, as though they've had, never had any children. Everything has just gone. And then the news, so the news reaches uh, Sidon. It then goes to Egypt. And in verse 5, we read, they will be in anguish, a anguish at the report from Tyre. And the news then crosses over to the far, far away Spanish city of Tarshish. Everyone is affected by this news. Why? Because all these economies are linked. Okay, we, we think we live in a global world now, don't we, where, you know, the, a war in the Ukraine can stop grain exports from that country, which has an economic impact on us here in Australia. We live in a global world, but this too was a global economy, and these nations are feeling the pain of the fall of Tyre. They're all joining in mourning for Tyre. This great economic city with all its global reach, it's finished. The city has become bankrupt. The, think of the markets are, have crashed down. As, it's as though the world has plunged into a depression. It's like Black Friday. Black Friday, when Wall Street crashed. This is like the global economic crisis. This is the end of an era. It's finished for this city. The people are in anguish. Now, we've seen something of this downfall in our own time, haven't we? You, um, some of you will remember 1987, when the share market crashed on that Black Monday and people were watching the big boards in the New York Stock Exchange. And here's a quote from an observer. Someone said, there were grown men crying in the pit as their entire world unraveled. Some men lost everything they had ever worked for. Hey, grown men crying as they just watched, watched all their money disappear in an instant, right? That's what's happening here in Isaiah 23. People are wailing. People are in anguish. People are stunned into silence at the great downfall of this city. And friends, can I just say at this point, it shows you how foolish it is to put all your security into money, doesn't it? It shows you how stupid it is to tie up your own sense of personal worth and security into wealth. Don't bank on wealth. It can be gone in an instant. It can, it can, the market can crash at any moment. What you have today, you may not have tomorrow. Now, why has this happened? Why has this happened? In verse 8, look at verse 8, the question is asked, who planned this against Tyre? Who could have possibly done this? Who could have possibly caused this to happen against Tyre? Um, well, the answer in verse 9 says, the Lord Almighty planned it. The Lord Almighty planned it. Or verse 11 the Lord has stretched out his hand over the sea and made its kingdoms treble, tremble. He has given an order concerning Phoenicia that her fortresses be destroyed. Who has done this? The Lord has done this. The, Lord's, the Lord has caused this to happen. He's given the order, he's stretched out his hand, and it's happened. See, God is in control of the markets going up and down. You know, this city of Tyre will be destroyed and the other kingdoms will tremble. And why did God do this? Well, we get the full answer in verse 9. The Lord Almighty planned it to bring down her pride. 
in all her splendor and to humble all who are renowned in the earth. Okay, again, we see like the Babylonians, why has God done this? It's because of their pride. Do you see that the system is not the problem? The issue is not the system. The issue that God has is the proud heart behind the system. The, the system's not the problem. God's not opposed to capitalism, right? What he's opposed to is he's opposed to the proud human heart, the pompous pride that lies behind so much of our wealth and our wealth collecting. You know, we sometimes think in our world that what we need to do is we need to fix the system. We need to um, just fix the systemic problems and then all the problems will go away. No. We can fix the system, but you know, the biggest problem behind the system still remains. The proud human heart. There's nothing wrong with wealth. Uh, there's nothing wrong with enjoying wealth. But you know, when you have money, you know what it does? It, ha it has the potential to lure you into a sense of, of false thinking. You know, you can, make, you can think, when you have a lot of money, you can think, I have arrived. I'm secure. I don't need anyone else. I don't need to put my trust in anything else because I've got all my own resources, thank you very much. And, and you know, you can just pull out your credit card whenever you have a problem and you can just tap it on that machine and all your problems will go away and you don't have to think about it anymore because you have the money. And what has happened is wealth has become your saviour. Wealth has become the, the thing that you look to to give you your security and to rescue you out of any danger that you're in. But do you realise, and I think you do, that the biggest bank account can't stop the doctor sharing with you some bad news. The biggest bank account can't stop you from, you know, not quite putting your foot on the brake at the right time and getting into an accident. Money doesn't insulate you from getting your heart broken or losing your job or losing your memory. Money can't stop those things. It's, it's foolish to put your security in money when God is your security. That's why Paul says to Timothy, warn people not to put their trust in money, but to put their trust in God. He's the one who gives you your security. He's the, his love is the only love that you can never lose. See, this is the message that we need to hear. We need to hear that money is insecure and it's a foolish place. It's a wrong place to put our security. Don't base your life on it. But what's the principle in life that we can all bank on? Because secondly, there's a huge twist here in this, in this chapter. Have a look at verse 15. Verse 15, we read, At that time, Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years, the span of a king's life. But at the end of these 70 years, it will happen to Tyre as in the song of the prostitute. Take up a harp, walk through the city, you forgotten prostitute, play the harp well, sing many a song, so that you will be remembered. See, Tyre here is likened to a prostitute, you know, a prostitute who is um, getting old and not attracting as many customers as she once used to. Um, Tyre is like a seductive prostitute out hustling the nations, and now she's, she's old. No one wants her anymore. And so look what happens next. Verse 17, we read, At the end of 70 years, the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to her lucrative prostitution and will pl ply her trade with all the kingdoms on the face of the earth. What's going to happen? There's a twist here. Tyre will be restored. The prostitute will be back in business. After 70 years, Tyre will be restored and Tyre will make a comeback. What will happen is God will restore her fortunes. Wow. Can, can you just picture that for a moment? See, God caused this great city to crash. 
and now God has restored her and brought her back. See, it's a reminder that God can do what he wants when it comes to money, can't he? God is in control of all of the money in the world and he can cause it he can cause the markets to crash and he can cause them to be restored. God is behind recessions and stocks going up and down. God is in control of that, you know, that um, figure that you see when you're driving along near a petrol station and you think, oh, that's a good price. I'll stop in there and fill up my tank. God's in control of that number that goes up on that petrol price. God's in control of the number that your bank sends you in, the, in, the, in a letter and says, your interest rates have gone up. Um, God is in control of inflation. God's in control of the NASDAQ. He's in, in control of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. He controls what goes into your bank account. He's in control of all of it. And we think we control these things, don't we? Oh, fool us. Fool us. We can't, you know, our best economic experts can't even predict when the market is going to crash. We have no idea. We just don't know these things. But God does. He, because he controls these things. He makes markets crash and he can make them come back. See, God's word to rich Sydney is this. God is in control of finances, not us. He's in control of markets, not us. But there's another twist here, a further twist in this chapter. Look at verse 18. We read, Yet her profit, that's Tyre, and her earnings will, will be set apart for the Lord. They will not be stored up or hoarded. Her profits will go to those who live before the Lord for abundant food and fine clothes. Do you see what, what will happen to the wealth of Tyre? Isaiah says it will be set apart for the Lord. Now that word set apart is the word holy. It will be holy for the Lord, set apart for him. See, friends, here's the principle. All of wealth is God's and he will use it exactly as he wants. It's all his. It's not ours. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's God's. And he can use human wealth no matter where it comes from, no matter whose pockets it comes out of, he can use it for his own glory. God, can, God is quite capable of taking money that is corrupt and he can redeem it and use it as something which is holy for his glory. See, every last penny of Tyre can be redeemed into something beautiful for God. Isn't that your story? Hasn't that happened in your life? When you came to Christ, you went from someone who was unholy, you, were, you became someone who was holy. That's what the death of Jesus did for you. You were bought with a price. You were purchased by God. You were set apart for him. You were someone who was unholy and you have now become holy to him. What a wonderful gift God has given you. Your whole life now is set apart for him. If you want to know what that word holy means, stick another L in it and put a W on the front. All right? What does holy mean? Holy with a W. It means you're holy, completely belonging to him. You're holy his. Okay? And that includes your money. It's all his. See, the Bible is giving us a principle so we can understand wealth and money. Here's the principle. It's all God's. He owns it. Every little last piece of it, it's his. Every little possession that you have, it belongs to him. Every little cup of coffee that you buy for yourself, that is a gift from God. That's, it's using God's money to buy something for yourself. Right? It's all God's. Uh, you have money in the first place because he's given it to you. He's not only given you the ability to, to earn it or the inheritance, um, but he's given you the opportunity to own it. Do you know what we are? We are his money managers. 
That's who we are. We manage the money that God has given us. And you, you might have a story of shame like Tyre's. And it's a wonderful thing. God can take unholy people, he can take corruption, and he can turn it into a story of redemption. God can take the dirty, the unwashed, the unworthy, and he can redeem it for himself and make it holy. Holy to him, every aspect of you, including your wallet. It's all his. Friends, we've seen that at work in our church, haven't we? We've seen that wonderfully at work in, in our church through our, um, our pledging last month that, you know, we ask people, can you consider giving to, to put on um, Steve as a, as a cross-cultural ministry worker two days a week? And is, isn't it, wasn't it a joy to give? Wasn't it a joy to see the, the generosity of God's people? I'm, I'm so thankful to you and I'm so thankful to, to God for the generosity of his people. Thank you. Thank you. But do you see, every last piece of, it, of us can be redeemed into something beautiful for God. And so, finally, what's the investment for us? In other words, what does this passage say to us? What's the bottom line in reading us? You, you realize that when Isaiah speaks this prophecy, he's not standing in the harbor of Tyre, is he? to speak these words. You know who he speaks this prophecy to? The people of Judah. He's speaking this to God's people. And so the question for us is, what should God's people learn from this chapter? I think it's this. Be aware of being allured away from God. See, there's a good reason why Tyre is presented as a prostitute. It's because prostitutes seduce and Tyre is a picture of a world that wants to seduce us away from Christ. Isaiah is saying, God is the one who owns all the wealth, all the power. He's sovereign over money. We, we know this, but how are we going to let that work upon our hearts so that we're not seduced by this world? You know what we need to do? We need to make him our treasure. We need to make him our security. We're, we're, we're about to do that when we come to the Lord's Supper. You know, at the Lord's Supper, it's an opportunity for us to make God our treasure and to, you know, reflect again upon what he did for us by sending his dear and precious son for us at the cross where he made you his treasure you're his treasure, and we need to keep making him our treasure. And the question for us this morning is, what is it that you've set your heart upon? Where's your heart this morning? What is it about this world that dazzles you and bedazzles you? What is it that you find that you're fixated upon? You know, Jesus said, where your heart is, there is your treasure. What, what did he mean by that? Here's what he means. He means that everyone here in this room who's listening to me right now has set your heart on something. You're actually allured by something. And, you know, all of us say, if, if only I have this in my life, then my life will have pleasure. I'll have security. I would have made it. I'll have meaning. It could be you, you've got in mind a, a certain figure in your bank account. You think, if I reach that figure, oh, I, I will have arrived. Or you might think, oh, here's my personal budget that I'd like to achieve. Or it could be a certain career or status that you're aiming for. We can all be allured by Tyre. What is it that allures you? Remember the words of Jesus, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. See, if you've made him your treasure, what do you do? You seek what he wants. You seek his kingdom, his righteousness. You manage your money for his purposes and his glory. You work on your own personal righteousness. You, you, you look at your life and anything that is unholy, you, you get rid of it. 
because you're set apart for him. That's seeking after his kingdom. That's setting kingdom goals. What do you pray for in your life? You know, you can tell what your heart is set upon by what you actually pray for. You know, someone, um, I can say her name actually because I asked for her permission. Sandra said to me um, uh, recently, she said, you know those five things that we were, you mentioned in um, the vision series for us to pray for? What are they again? I, w- I want to pray for them. And so um, here they are. There they are, the five things for us to for us to pray for. An annual holiday kids club, that's this week. Pray for that, won't you? Growing our youth group, an after school kids club, 50 new people to become Christians, another morning church and evening church. Pr- these, these are the things to, to pray for over the next five years. Now, I'm not saying that you need to be praying for these things to show that you're seeking after God's kingdom, no. But I I just want to tell you, be like Sandra. You know, she wanted to pray for these things, and I think it shows where her treasure is. What do you pray for? What are you seeking after? What do you think about all day? What do you worry about? What is it that you don't have that makes you unhappy? See, if you truly treasure God, he's your security. You can look to him to provide. So seek first his kingdom, his righteousness. Let me pray for us. Father, help us not to love the world or the things that are in the world. Help us to love you and to make you our treasure. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, friends, um, we're about to sing... And uh, during the next song, we will um, pass out the bread and the juice. And um, when, um, when you take the bread and the juice, hang on to it um, because we'll eat and drink together. This is an opportunity for us to reflect and remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. We do this in fellowship. We do this together. And so um, if you're someone who doesn't yet know Jesus... We encourage you just to let the bread and the juice pass by and you can just watch and see um, what happens in a meal like this. Um, But for all of us, let's stand and sing and the bread and the juice um, will be passed out.